everybody. How, how is everybody doing today? Okay, I hope I hope you're gonna enjoy the cookies and uh, and the punch and, and all the refreshment uh, because it's very exciting. Lights lights are coming up, so I know we have a lot of people. Welcome everybody. You will really enjoy this lecture. Let me let me assure you. Uh, and uh, of course, let me applaud this all this class of guests. We have board of regents members. Of this refuse uh, is here, so that's welcome. And uh, also, I know Armin Mantini. Uh, okay, welcome. Uh, Dr. Shelton, the college president, is here. Uh, Dr. Matthews is here. All right, so thank you. Welcome. So, uh, let me tell you that, of course, how, how, let me ask you a simple question how much of the Texas history do we know? A lot, right? So, so now this. This is going to be a very, very interesting part of the Texas history. And so let's introduce Andres, uh, Professor Andres Resendez. Uh, he's a winner of the Bancroft Prize. This is, this is a huge, uh, huge thing. And, and of course, I'm not going to mention it anymore because it's just too long. And so let me again give the microphone to Andres, please. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you to um, Limus for this nice introduction. Thank you to Michael Beveridge for making it all possible. Thank you everyone for uh, uh, investing some of your time um, to come uh, in this lecture. So um, it is a, a, great, a great honor and a pleasure to be here because this is a book about a disastrous expedition as you will see. Um, that unfolded here, right here, and so uh, it is always, uh, so when I was writing the book, I came around and looked around, um, and we have yet to unearth some 16th century artifacts to really uh, pin down exactly where this all happened, um, but, uh, but certainly this is uh, a place very dear to my heart, and there are some really interesting tidbits about the biology and the flora and the fauna uh, here that you will recognize as I go through this uh, expedition. Before I start, let me um, see a show of hands of who of you have read uh, anything related to the Cabeza de Vaca expedition. So some of you, but uh, okay. So um, this is always a question because some of you may know every detail there is to know about this expedition. Others may know very little or nothing about it. So we'll just go together through, the, through, through this amazing story. Um, and I will start by saying that we're all fascinated by first contacts, stories of first contacts. And uh, three years ago, we learned from DNA evidence that Polynesians and Native Americans came together sometime, someplace around the, you know, about the 12th or 13th century, sometime uh, in some place in the coast of, the Pacific coast of the Americas or perhaps in one of the islands. But we don't know anything about the details of that encounter in the 12th or 13th century. The story that I am going to uh, tell briefly uh, to you is, um, is similarly a, a story of early, amazing early ex encounters but unlike that one, uh, this one was extraordinarily well documented. Um, it was quite likely the story of the earliest sustained European exploration of what would become the United States. And it is a story um, that, uh, that is absolutely fascinating in its details. Uh, the expedition was a private Spanish venture um, that turned into an unmitigated disaster. So of the 300 European colonizers who started out on this expedition, only four survived, three Spaniards in commanding positions and one African slave. They spent almost a decade uh, living amongst various indigenous societies and journeyed through parts of the American Southwest and uh, that no other Europeans or Africans had ever seen before. So it is literally, typically when you um, hear about stories of early encounters, when you dig deeper, you see that other Europeans had been earlier. This is bona fide one in which these were the very first individuals who did this. Uh, the mission of this expedition uh, was to explore and colonize Florida. 
um, and some of the territories around Florida. Um, and uh, it was an area that was very poorly understood, uh, if at all, by the Spanish at the time. Uh, in fact, uh, the area in question, it was also gigantic. It was four times the size of Spain. Um, so that was the place that these 300 men, 10 women, and 40 horses were supposed to colonize. They were supposed to establish two settlements and three forts in this gigantic area. Um, and so uh, things went really wrong from the very start. So let me, first of all, show you what we're talking about. So Florida for the Spanish uh, was this peninsula and the, let me see if I can, is this, oops, oh, sorry. Um, oh, here we go. Um, so it was the, you know, they knew from, so the Spanish were established in the islands of the Caribbean. Uh, in fact, the story will un unfold first from Hispaniola or Española. The, it was called the Spanish island because it was the first speck in the new world that was uh, occupied by the Spanish and then Cuba. And from there, they journeyed into this peninsula. And so they basically said, okay, we're going to let you colonize this peninsula and everything to the west of that. And so as I said, this area is four times the size of Spain. They really didn't know what lay to the west of that peninsula. Um, things went wrong from, from the very beginning. So this is uh, also, let me show you the uh, origins of the expedition from Spain. They, uh, they would journey for about a week. They typically expeditions from Spain and I will say a little something about how they were organized in uh, Seville, which is this remarkable port uh, city um, in southern Spain in the province of Andalusia. They would sail for a week to the Canary Islands where they would top off provisions and get ready and then they would sail for another month to the Spanish island uh, where they got additional provisions and then got ready to go to, um, to Florida in this case. But um, the, uh, the expedition was disastrous from the very beginning. It was hit by a hurricane, first of all. Um, so uh, Cabeza de Vaca uh, and the others were getting provisions in the southern coast of Cuba. Um, and unbeknownst to them, uh, a mass of air had started circling around a low depression and eventually this formed into a tropical storm and it formed into a hurricane that hit the expedition. They were just getting started. They hadn't even gotten to their destination. Um, and, uh, you know, close to 40 men per perished in this, uh, in this hurricane. This would have been a formidable um, environmental and uh, meteorological event for Europeans because they had never experienced hurricanes. So hurricanes, as you know, require a lot of heat. And so uh, Europeans or, or people in the Mediterranean don't, didn't uh, experience these kinds of violent storms. Uh, Columbus was the first to report it, some of the hurricanes in the Caribbean, uh, but it, they were still quite no a novelty at the time when this expedition took place uh, in the, this is taking place in the late 1520s. And let me just say one more thing about, um, about this. Uh, let me just go back. So the 1520s, we're talking about um, an era very early on where the Spanish have already taken over central Mexico. This is after the downfall of the Aztec Empire in Mexico City. They have also established a little settlement here in Santi Esteban del Puerto in what is now uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, province of Tamaulipas in Mexico, due south from Texas. But other than that, this was completely unexplored territory untouched by Europeans uh, in the 1520s and early 1530s. So, so as I said, uh, so they, they are hit by the storm uh, before that and we have uh, Cabeza de Vaca, the royal treasurer of the expedition um, who, and one of the three Spanish survivors of this expedition who would later write about his experiences in a, in a remarkable uh, first-hand account. And he would say, the storm was so strong that it was necessary for us to band together in groups of seven or eight men 
our arms locked with one another in order to save ourselves from being carried away by the wind. We were as fearful of being killed by walking under the trees as amongst the houses since the storm was so great that even the trees, like the houses, fell. And thus we walk all night long. Okay, so these setback uh, delayed the expedition that they decided to uh, spend some more time in Cuba repairing and getting more men and more uh, ships. Uh, but eventually they got underway. And uh, uh, however, the, the setbacks continued. So there were essentially two additional mistakes that happened in this expedition. One was navigational. And so for that, I need a little bit of explanation. This is one thing that has remained a little uh, difficult to explain in the expedition. Um, so, so let me show you this map. So the uh, expedition was going to depart from um, the northern uh, coast of Cuba around what is now Havana. And they were going to start not in Florida, even though this is called the Florida Expedition. The, the whole territory covered Florida, but it also covered uh, parts of the continent, as I said, all the way to the west. And so the leader of the expedition, um, his name is Panfilo de Narvaez, a man who was sort of the uh, the, the exemplar of the Spanish conquistador, tall and, and red-headed and muscular and with a booming voice. And the description at the time is that, uh, that sounded as if it came from a cave, so very deep, um, decided that uh, he was going to start at the other end of the territory apportioned to him by the crown. Um, and he did that in part because it was going to be very close to this Spanish settlement that w lay due south already. Um, and so it, it would start from there and he would start exploring and then finding a suitable place for the two settlements and the three forts that they were that these 300 people were going to establish there uh, for settling. Uh, but um, so, so you would think that even in the 16th century that uh, any competent pilot would be able to sail directly uh, from east to west in a straight line, almost a straight line east to west. Uh, but uh, the pilot made a colossal navigational mistake. And instead of going like that, um, he ended up at the other end. So in, in the vicinity of Tampa Bay, Florida, in the west coast of Florida. Um, you would think that the pilot would have been completely incompetent for doing that, but there was very good reasons. First of all, there were very few pilots, Spanish pilots, that were familiar with the, uh, with the Gulf of Mexico in the late 1520s. Uh, but and more importantly, they were contending with the strongest current in the world, the Gulf Stream, which, as you can see from this map, it enters the Gulf of Mexico from the south, from this opening between Yucatan and Cuba, and then circles around and exits uh, in the opening between Cuba and the Florida Peninsula. And so by going directly from east to west, this expedition would be driving directly against this very powerful current. Um, so, uh, so what this current would have done, as you would imagine, is first of all, it would slow down your progress because you were, even if the wind was going strong, uh, you would uh, slow down considerably over the ground. Even though you, you would feel that you were navigating, you were in fact covering far less ground than what you would imagine. And so, uh, so, so the time that it would take you uh, would be considerably longer than you would expect it for this passage. And second of all, given that it was slightly going north, uh, it would also be pushed a little bit to the north. Uh, and again, it's very difficult. So remember, these, these 16th century pilots only have charts and a compass. That's all they had. That was the uh, navigational equipment that they had. Uh, so no, no GPS, nothing like that. Um, and so bottom line is that they drifted into what is now Tampa Bay. So that was the first mistake. It was still within the territory apportioned to Narvaez and Cabeza de Vaca and the others, but it was at the other end. In fact, they had ended up 1,500 miles away 
from where they intended to be. So that was mistake number one. Mistake number two was that Narvaez, the leader of this expedition, decided to separate the ships from the, uh, from the men and the horses. Uh, so believing that they had landed around here, close to Santi Esteban del Puerto, and they were going to go south, they were going to, so uh, they said, okay, so let's just uh, disembark all the men uh, let's get all the horses off the, uh, of the ships. Remember, uh, not remember, but the horses had a really rough time uh, getting on these ships. The horses were transported on slings in these 16th century ships. Uh, they initially started with 80 horses and only 41 horses had remained by the time they landed uh, in Tampa Bay. Uh, skinny horses that could not even be mounted. So they let them go ashore. Um, and, uh, and the, so, so the men would continue the idea there in their minds, what they were doing is the men would continue overland and the ships would continue coasting and they would meet by this river. Their, their objective was to get to this river, so-called the river of the palm trees, El Rio de las Palmas in Spanish. Um, but they had ended up here um, and uh, even though, of course, everybody realized that the coast is wrong, the overall shape of the coast is wrong, the sun would be rising and setting in the wrong place because they were here rather than here, forming a good idea of the overall shape of the coast is difficult just in one spot. So they thought that perhaps it would, this is a little weird peninsula and things will uh, become, uh, no, you know, as they should be later on. So, uh, so that was, uh, uh, mistake number two. So, so they disembarked 300 men, 40 horses, and they left the 10 women. Uh, it's uh, interesting to know some people that these early, very early voyages of expedition also included women. Uh, these were mostly uh, wives and daughters of some of the commanding officers. Uh, but in this case, it was deemed so dangerous because this is completely uncharted territory for the Spanish that the 10 women remain on board the ships along with the crew uh, of, of 100. So it was in initially 400 and the 300 men and the horses would get off. Well, um, you know, you, uh, you would imagine uh, what happened. Uh, they were supposed to meet by the Rio de las Palmas but no such river was close. It was in fact 1,500 miles away um, and uh, the overland expedition and the ships would never meet again. So the ships would remain for a year uh, searching for the land party and it would never be found. Um, and the expedition, the expeditionaries were essentially stranded uh, thousands of miles away from the closest Spanish controlled territory. So this is the setup of the expedition. The expeditionaries on land uh, made heroic efforts to save themselves. They walked all along the Florida Peninsula. Um, and uh, when it was very clear that they were not going to find their ships, they decided to, uh, they reached um, the Florida Panhandle right here. So this is the approximate territory, uh, I mean, trajectory of the expedition. So again, um, even though not so many people in the, large, in the public at large know about these very early expedition, uh, it has been, it is well known to scholars and scholars, archeologists, historians, et cetera, have passionately argued over the exact whereabouts of the expedition. I mean, it is the ultimate um, mystery because you know, if you read the accounts, th there are only two uh, accounts left of these expedition, fairly detailed accounts that complement each other well. Um, but these two uh, provide some geographic clues, but of course no definite uh, proof of their whereabouts. So, uh, so there are all kinds of uh, you know, discussions about exactly where they went. But we know that they ended up uh, in what is now the Florida Panhandle. Uh, by then, they, uh, out of the 300, about 250 uh, Spanish men survived and they decided, they, uh, they made a fateful decision. They emerged 
and they saw that pretty much like it happens here in the coast of Texas, this is a shallow area, a shallow part of the Gulf of Mexico with some barrier islands fringed by massive beds of oysters. And so it was very clear to them that the, the Spanish ships that they had abandoned would never be able to enter close to, to you know, to, to find them in this area. So since that was the case, they uh, decided on an extraordinary plan and that was to uh, kill their horses and to melt their weapons in order to make saws and axes. And uh, while they are consuming, because they were starved, while they were consuming the flesh of their horses and while they were melting their, uh, you know, their, their weapons, they would uh, use these to chop down some trees and they would make five barges. Uh, each barge would be carrying 50 men, as I said, 250, and a heap of corn that they had been, uh, you know, uh, taking from the indigenous groups that live around this area, uh, the Appalachia area. Um, and they would essentially sail out of these maze of oyster beds, at least into the open ocean so that there would be a chance that they would be spotted by the ships that they hope, they hope and pray are still looking around or possibly to get uh, to Santi Esteban del Puerto, the Spanish control uh, port because they still hoped that it was close by, even though, again, they were still pretty far away from that. So, uh, so this is a, a remarkable, I mean, again, uh, you have to admire the tenacity uh, of these individuals and the skill of these individuals. Just imagine uh, being, let me show you a picture of, this is the, I went to this area, this is what you would find today. Uh, so they had, um, nothing. Uh, they would have to uh, really jury rig a bellows, for example, in order to get enough heat in order to melt their weapons and turn them into axes. Uh, and so they, they did that by hunting uh, deer, for example, and using the, the, the skin of the deer in order to make the bellows, um, etc. They use uh, little reeds in order to drive the air to use as pipes for the bellows, etc. And then um, I made some calculations. They would have had to chop down about 150 trees a foot in diameter uh, in order to make five barges capable of holding 50 men on each barge and, uh, and a heap of corn, as I was saying, and some water. Um, think about also about the difficulties of, um, of getting water, fresh water, water about, aboard these uh, vessels. So we live in an age of water bottles and we don't think twice about the difficulties of holding water uh, in, uh, you know, in a barge like that. Uh, many societies around the world have used ceramics to do that and these Spanish survivors did not choose that route, but instead that they decided to cure the, uh, the, the legs of the horses that they were killing and turn them into water bottles. So that's how they solved that problem. They uh, also uh, used the manes and the tails of the horses and braided them together in order to get rope, in order to lash the, uh, the logs together. Um, and, uh, and they used their own clothes in order to fashion square uh, sails. Uh, because here you have five gigantic rafts that each one, again, according to my calculations, weighing about 15 tons, uh, in order to be able to support 50 men, you know, barely floating above the, uh, the, the water. I mean, it would have been like seven or eight inches above the water line. Uh, so clearly, uh, you know, the, the, the waves would be washing over these individuals. Um, and, um, and in order to prevent them from spinning out of control, they needed a way to harness the, uh, they made oars, so they were going to, uh, to, uh, to use the oars, but they also, hope to harness the power of the wind. And so they made these uh, improvised sails that must have been a sight to behold. So incredible feat of resourcefulness. And, uh, and all the while, while all of this is happening, uh, they are killing their horses. And they are becoming more and more vulnerable to indigenous attacks. Because again, uh, they started out as Spanish conquistadors, but they are very quickly becoming survivalists. 
And it is one thing to deal with America uh, with, web with far better um, military technology and especially the horses and the uh, firearms. And it's quite an another to uh, deal with Native Americans and with America uh, by their own wits, to be able to survive by their wits. And th th so by killing their horses and by melting their weapons, they are giving away their their superior military advantage, and they are turning, uh, trading that for these five vessels that may or may not be able to take them uh, home to safety. Um, so this is the, again, approximate trajectory of this expedition, and I want to leave some, some time for questions and answers. Um, so, uh, so this is where they started from. Again, we don't know the exact location. They called it the Bay of the Horses because that's where they killed their horses. And also you can imagine to a Spanish conquistador in the 16th century, the horse was their most prized possession. You can imagine the grim ritual of killing one horse every other day in order to get, uh, the, to get food. Um, and then finally your horse got picked. Uh, but uh, for a month they traveled uh, and things seem to be going okay for the first time since the start of the expedition. They uh, run into some trouble, uh, meaning that they, for example, started uh, uh, the, the, the water bottles that they had made out of the horse legs started running away, and so they, uh, they could not hold the fresh water. And so they had to uh, go into shore and uh, risk attack by indigenous groups um, you know, to get some additional fresh water. Um, they also were running low on corn. That was the only, I mean, there were oysters and other things, but not, nothing that you could take for a longer period of time. So the only thing that they could really keep for a long time was corn, um, and that was running low. Um, they also mention remarkable things, like for example, they, uh, they experienced a storm in all of these, this is happening in the fall of 1528. Um, and uh, they report a, uh, a storm and the wind is also pushing them. It's the wind is blowing from the, from the land towards the sea. Um, and so these barges, even though they wanted to stay close to the coast, within sight of the coast, these, uh, this wind uh, is pushing them deep into the, into the Gulf of Mexico, which is something that they struggled mightily against um, and because they needed water. But finally, they got to a place where even from the sea you could drink the water. It was uh, fresh enough. And clearly the only place where that would happen was a massive river, the Mississippi River, where uh, the, the flow of fresh water would get so in deep into the ocean that they could actually drink they had the luxury for a little bit of being able to drink without having to risk going overland uh, for a little time. So we, we have that and we can pinpoint their location at that point. But eventually um, they, uh, they almost run out of food. The barges become separated in the middle of the ocean. The uh, leader of the expedition, Pamphilo de Narvaez, says that no longer it's a time for an expedition. Now it's uh, every man for himself and so save yourself as you can, and so the barges become separated, and they land around here uh, on the coast of Texas in different parts uh, and with different fates. Um, so again, we can talk about the exactly um, what, uh, what happened, but uh, all five barges eventually made it um, the southernmost barge right here, the southernmost uh, barge landed, but a group of indigenous peoples known as the Camones uh, descended on the famished crew and killed them all. Not a single one survived. We know about this because uh, other indigenous groups uh, traded the items pillaged from that uh, barge. Um, and it was traded to other indigenous peoples who held some Spanish with whom the Spanish uh, talked. And so we know about the fate of that southernmost barge. I mean, the, the resilience of those individuals is incredible. I mean, by then, I don't know how they landed 150 or 200 miles to the south of the others 
uh, they must have been almost dead by the time they, uh, they made landfall so far south, as far south as possibly as the uh, Padre Island of today. Um, the men of the two other rafts landed around present-day Matagorda Bay. Uh, these, true, uh, these two crews started walking south to re reach Panuco. So their idea was that they still were trying to reach um, Santi Esteban del Puerto, again, thinking, hoping, praying that it was going to be close enough. Um, and so upon landing, they started going uh, south. But sometime in November, uh, they halted their march and decided to spend the winter uh, in the wooded area. So as you know better than I do, uh, this part of Texas uh, is a, uh, an incredible uh, prison of water, meaning that you have to cross rivers wherever you go. The rivers become very cold. This is November. This is also in the Little Ice Age. Uh, so, and uh, many of these Spanish explorers did not know how to swim. Um, even though they were explorers, uh, you know, they, many of them were from central Spain. They had never learned how to swim. And so that proved to be a deterrent enough. And so they decided to spend the winter uh, where they were. They found a good area with lots of fresh water and some oysters. Uh, but, um, but they uh, eventually ran out of food and resorted to cannibalism. Uh, until they, uh, they all perished. The last two barges, the ones that arrived around here, so again, uh, there are <laughs> uh, vigorous scholarly discussions about exactly where all of this is taking place. Uh, these two barges arrived at an island described in the two accounts that we have. The descriptions that we have uh, do not perfectly match Galveston um, Island. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's a little smaller island maybe than Galveston. Uh, so some scholars have theorized that it may have been Follett Island or San Luis Peninsula, even though it's no, no, you know, it's no longer an island. Uh, you know, over the intervening 500 years, there has been lots of shifts in the coast, so it could well have been an island 500 years ago. Um, so again, it's, it's difficult to know just from the clues that we get from the, uh, from, the, from the expedition. But they both remarkably landed uh, on, the, uh, on this island around Galveston, and uh, there may have been 80 survivors left. So 40 in one barge and 40 in another one. But over the, the, the course of the harsh winter of 1528 and 1529, that, uh, from other sources we learned, was a particularly harsh winter. Uh, most of them died, dwindling to, down to a dozen, then 10, and ultimately six, and eventually only four, the four that I, uh, that I survived. That, that I, uh, that I, so here's a, another view of where these, uh, these five barges landed, the approximate locations. Okay, so let me say a little bit about the four survivors. So one of them was Cabeza de Vaca, the author of these account, first person account, that is one of the main sources for this expedition. Uh, he was the highest ranking and the oldest of the survivors. He may have been in his 40s, early 40s. Um, he comes across, at least in his narrative, as the de facto leader of the castaways. Uh, so Cabeza de Vaca was a member of an illustrious family in Andalusia in southern Spain, uh, so right here. So he came from Jerez de la Frontera. Um, and, uh, you know, I can talk about his illustrious family, but his paternal grandfather had been uh, involved in the conquest of the Canary Islands uh, in the 15th century, and so one of the direct antecedents of the discovery and conquest of the New World. Uh, so a very important forebear. Um, and so he, by joining this expedition, he wanted to uh, continue in his family's lineage of these uh, great uh, service in favor of the, uh, of the Spanish crown. Um, the other two Spaniards uh, were younger men in their 
20s or early 30s. Like Cabeza de Vaca, they belong to the higher echelons of Spanish society. So one of them was named Alonso del Castillo, and he was more of a man of letters. He came from Salamanca, which was the university town, the main university town of Spain. Uh, his father was a physician, a detail that will be very important for what I'm about to say, uh, So, meaning that he must have grown up at the time. Physicians actually had their practices right in their homes, so the patients would come to their homes. They would have a little room uh, below in their rooms, and that's where they would receive. And so Castillo, growing up, would have seen his father perform various procedures, and he would have been familiar with uh, Spain, you know, the European medical equipment of the 16th century. Um, so, so that was uh, Alonso del Castillo. The other Spanish in commanding position was a man named Andres Dorantes. Uh, he was a man from central Spain, from Gibraltar. I don't know that. Okay, I don't have it here. Um, um, he was more of a man of action. He bore a scar in his face. He had participated in a, uh, a rebellion in Spain in the, in the early 1520s, the revolt of the Comuneros. Um, and uh, he had participated on the side of the Spanish crown, had, uh, and because of that, he was rewarded. So he was, again, a, an up-and-coming um, nobleman in Spain. And on the strength of his, uh, on, of his services to the crown, he was appointed as commander, as, as captain, as, as a subsidiary captain in this expedition. So both Castillo and, uh, and Dorantes were captains in this expedition, whereas Cabeza de Vaca was the royal treasurer, so the man in charge of uh, making sure that the crown would receive its cut of the proceeds, whatever they, this expedition found, the, the crown would get a portion of that, and so Cabeza de Vaca was the man, in the representative of the crown who would make sure that the crown received this, its, its part of the, uh, of the, uh, of the, uh, of, of the reward. The last castaway, the fourth one, is perhaps the most extraordinary and interesting. Um, and his name is Esteban, or Estebanico. Um, he was a slave from Africa. And his very survival is very difficult to explain when we consider that the other three were Spaniards in commanding positions. Um, Esteban was originally from the town of Asamor, which is a small village uh, on the Atlantic coast of what is now Morocco. In, uh, you know, the Portuguese had colonized this town around 1513, 1512, 1513, and uh, they uh, had started um, uh, exporting people through the vagaries of the slave trade. They captured people in and around Asamora and shipped them to the, uh, to the Iberian Peninsula just across. So let me just go back. So here is Asamor. Um, so they would ship them um, to both Portugal and the slave markets in Spain, uh, particularly in Seville. And so even though we don't know the details, it is likely that Esteban uh, was taken by the Portuguese, sold in the slave markets of Seville, and the purchaser of Estebanico was none other than Andres Dorantes, the, the young man with the scar in his face. Um, and so these were the four survivors of this uh, disastrous expedition. Um, after landing on the coast of Texas, these four men, along with other roughly 80 survivors, came in contact with indigenous peoples of the area. And initially, they agreed to take the castaways into their homes. So rem remember, they just landed completely destitute on these barges, completely famished, uh, ex you know, without clothes, and about to die from exposure. Um, and so the indigenous peoples took them into their homes, fed them. But what started out as a, you know, a uh, guest, uh, host-guest kind of a relationship, eventually evolved into bondage. And so the castaways deterioration, uh, situation deteriorated even further when some of the uh, indigenous peoples became afflicted by an illness of the bowels, possibly uh, the century brought by the Europeans and began dying. And of course, the strangers became the obvious culprits. And so Cabeza de Vaca and his companions became fully enslaved at that point. 
They spend their time collecting wood for fire or digging for roots and suffered various indignities at the hands of their native masters who mocked them, slapped them, and on occasion beat them with sticks. Uh, their livelihood on the coast of Texas around here was really precarious. Uh, the castaways and their native host lived through periods of relative abundance. Uh, they gorged themselves on aquatic roots, for example, in some parts of the winter, and prickly pears uh, or tunas, as uh, we say in Spanish, in the summer. But there were months of great hunger between uh, these, these foods, these periods of plenty. Um, in the winter months, the four travelers had to find ways to preserve their precious body temperature as well. Um, as I said, uh, this is the time of uh, the little ice age. So in spite of the heat that we come to associate with Texas or with, the, uh, or with uh, Florida, et cetera, when you read their accounts, they are constantly complaining about the utter incredible coldness that they are experiencing 500 years ago. They also had to protect themselves against the fauna of America. And this included, of course, poisonous snakes and mountain lions. But by far, the most vicious and recurrent were, uh, if you can imagine, the clouds of mosquitoes. Uh, to this day, Galveston, Houston area has the dubious distinction of possessing uh, one of the largest and most diversified concentrations of mosquitoes anywhere in North America. And so uh, 500 years ago, uh, you know, you, we can get, you, you could get bitten hundreds or even thousands of times, something that could actually result in very serious illness and death. So the castaways, the enslaved castaways, were forced to uh, stay up at night, keeping smoky fires for their indigenous slaves to, to keep away the mosquitoes. And these taxing activity went on for months or weeks, etc. Incredibly, the four castaways were able to survive through it all, and they actually lived and passed through a region that is fairly close to Laredo. Um, they may have crossed a river described as larger than the Guadalquivir River, which is the big river in Seville where they started from, which is, must have been the, the Rio Grande and perhaps around the Falcon uh, Reservoir area due south from here. Um, and, uh, and we have a remarkable uh, you know, description of these, uh, of these early, uh, these early uh, inhabitants. Uh, this is a 19th century description of the peoples inhabiting the barrier islands of Texas, the Carancaguas, as they were called by the Spanish and the Mexicans later on in the 1520s. Uh, these, um, you know, they are described as uh, particularly barbarous uh, by the Mexican and the Spanish, but they were supremely adapted to the atmosphere, to the environment of, uh, of Texas. Uh, they survived on prickly pears that were abundant and remain uh, abundant uh, in this area. They also uh, documented the first instances of uh, what Cabeza de Vaca uh, and the others referred to a, a very woolly cow, but in fact it's bison or, or buffalo. Uh, and this is more or less, again, the, uh, the uh, um, the trajectory of these uh, four uh, individuals. After six years of enslavement, the castaways, and I want to wrap this up very quickly, after six years of enslavement, the castaways finally were able to flee. And they also used their knowledge to refashion themselves into medicine men. And in fact, uh, one of the images that I use in my book is a, uh, a painting uh, that is at the Moody Library of the University of Texas um, Galveston branch. So you must know much better than I do where it is. Maybe some of you have seen this live. But it shows um, Cabeza de Vaca extracting an arrowhead from a patient, an indigenous patient. So basically, uh, again, it's very difficult to know what happened 500 years ago, but how they were able to transform themselves into medicine men 
is a little bit obscure, uh, but, in the, but it, the most likely explanation is that indigenous peoples believed in the 16th century that there were some individuals who were able to manipulate both the natural and the supernatural world. And these four castaways being so uh, different from themselves, coming from such unimaginably diff you know, distant places, um, must have some power. And so basically the indigenous masters initially forced the castaways to perform heal healings. And the castaways at first thought, this is ridiculous. We, we are not doctors and we, we can't do that. But the indigenous hosts and masters withdrew the food until they performed the healings. And so that's how they started uh, praying to God, to their own Christian God, to to give health to these individuals. That's number one. And the other one, as I just mentioned, Castillo was the son of a physician. So he may have known, if you read carefully the descriptions of the healings that they are, uh, that they are performing, there are some medical procedures that are taking place, extracting uh, arrowheads, ar arrowheads, dressing the wounds, etc., cetera, that uh, may have helped. Uh, so, so again, it's, it's very difficult to know exactly what happened but, uh, but the result, the end result of this is that they transform themselves from lowly uh, slaves into powerful medicine men. And so once they acquired the reputation, the reputation preceded them wherever they went. And so they were no longer held in bondage by anybody. Instead, indigenous peoples would actually pass them from one group to another as the most precious things that they possess. They would accompany them, they would hunt for them, they would bring water for them when they were crossing the desert. And so, uh, so it once again became a, a voyage of exploration, but the most remarkable voyage of exploration that you can imagine. So you have four castaways being supported by hundreds, sometimes thousands of indigenous followers who cater to their every needs um, and so that's why instead of, th this is one reason why we can explain how, even though their idea was to get to Santi Esteban del Puerto, the, the closest Spanish controlled territory, they decided that they no longer wanted to go there, but instead they took these U-turn into the heart of North America to go into places, to explore places that no other white or European people and African people had ever been to before. And so in this fashion, they were able to cross uh, from one coast to the other. They emerged in what is now the west coast of uh, Mexico. Um, and, uh, you know, and they were able to describe this incredible territory and they were able to write about it. Um, and they, uh, they took um, eight or nine years, depending on how you count, uh, through this whole ordeal. Okay, um, at the other end, and just briefly to finish this, uh, they encountered um, the cutting edge of the Spanish Empire moving from central Mexico into what is now northwestern Mexico. And this was not a, a, a good expedition. It was a slaving expedition. Uh, led by this man, Nuno de Guzman, who is, by all accounts, uh, one of the most ruthless uh, Spanish conquistadors that existed in this era, that lived in this era. Um, and uh, so one cavalry detachment uh, was the one who first ran into the, these four castaways, accompanied by six, still accompanied by 600 indigenous peoples. And so the castaways, the, I mean, the, the cavalry initially was super excited at the possibility of enslaving these 600 Indians, but there was a showdown between uh, the four castaways, or at least Cabeza de Vaca, and that's how he writes, uh, saying that no, they are not to be enslaved. Um, and so, uh, and, and so there, was, there was this uh, very dramatic uh, showdown at the, uh, at the end. For the time being, Cabeza de Vaca and his companions prevailed and the native es escorts remain free, uh, but, um, but eventually, uh, you know, colonialism took its course, and, uh, you know, in spite of the best intentions, 
uh, these Spanish expeditions in the Northwest continued their slaving expeditions. Um, at its most elemental, the castaways tale, this incredible tale constitutes in microcosm the much broader uh, story of how Europeans, Africans, and Native Americans set out to bridge the, enormal, the enormous cultural distances separating them. In essence, it is the story of America. The journey of Cabeza de Vaca, Esteban Nico, and the others was thus spiritual as much as physical. Their lives depended on their ability to understand the basic humanity of their indigenous masters and hosts. And time and again, as the survivors came within sight of a new native group, they had to find a middle ground. They were Europeans and African by birth, but were becoming American by experience. And so profound was the survivor's spiritual journey that fellow conquistadors could scarcely recognize them on that radiant spring day when they finally reemerge from the depths of the continent. Thank you so much. Yeah, so I'd be happy to, yes. Uh -huh. Very good question. So the 10 women, so I, this is the part where I contributed the most to the actual knowledge of this expedition. So the, uh, the 10 women spent a year along with the crews prowling up and down this coast and eventually they went back to Cuba and went back to, uh, to the uh, Hispaniola where they had come from. But uh, they did not, not, did not give up entirely the search. Uh, the wife of uh, Pamphilo de Narvaez, the leader of the expedition, must have been one of these formidable 16th century women who had both the means and the inclination to mount her own expedition, rescue expedition, to find the husband that had been uh, missing. And so she uh, essentially went to Havana purchased ships, uh, hired crews, and the only thing she could not do was to actually lead the expedition herself. So she um, uh, secured the services of a Spanish commander who took command of, the, of these ships and spent another year going up and down the coast of Florida trying to find the survivors. And eventually he also gave up the search uh, and went to Mexico, sold the uh, ships, and that was the end of that. But, uh, but really fascinating story about this uh, 16th century woman who really, uh, you know, wanted, anyways, did, went through, uh, Maria Marmolejo, yeah. Yes. Marmolejo, yeah, yes. Yeah, uh, so, so there are two main uh, accounts, as I was saying, for this expedition. One was the uh, first person narrative written by Cabeza de Vaca and published in 1542, so basically six years after returning. Um, and uh, you know, there are several editions uh, of that. Uh, you know, it, they, it's widely available. The second one was the so-called joint expedition I mean, so, sorry, joint report. So that is the testimonies of the three surviving Spaniards who were collated into another uh, document that, uh, that we, are, we also have. And so the two documents are not always, there are some inconsistencies between the two, but they complement each other well and uh, they are extraordinarily detailed. So we know a lot about that, yeah. Yes. Yeah, the right. Said, they died. They, yeah, they, they resorted to cabinet yeah. evolution, yeah. <coughs> because the uh, <laughs> Cabeza de Vaca writes, and the joint report as well, that uh, the, uh, they ate each other until only one remained alive. And he, with disarming logic, said, and because he had no one to eat him, he survived. He was later uh, rescued by indigenous peoples uh, who were appalled by this behavior of the Spanish. 
And so from that individual, we know what happened over that winter. So yes. Yes. They follow different fates. Um, two of the, so Cabeza de Vaca did make it back to Spain. He wanted to go back and to become a leader of a new expedition and he wanted to colonize this area that he had already been to. Instead, he was assigned a colony in what is now Paraguay in South America. The other two Spanish in commanding positions ended up marrying rich widows in Mexico City. Uh, so rich widows, wealthy widows, were a common fixture in 16th century uh, Mexico. They lived longer than their husbands. Their husbands were conquistadors, etc. They died and women retained possession of their, uh, their wealth and often acquired the wealth of their husbands. So, uh, so they married two wealthy women in Mexico City uh, the uh, Estebanico, the, the, uh, the African uh, slave, was sent back on an expedition and he was killed by the indigenous peoples in the second expedition going back. So, uh, so that's the sort of the shorthand of the fate of the four. But uh, yes. No, Nuno de Guzman, um, I mean, this is, I, I'm fascinated by this. Nuno de Guzman was a super ruthless conquistador. He was, he took thousands of natives from central Mexico. He passed through what is now the province of Michoacán in Mexico. He killed the leader and executed the leader of the Tarascan people, the indigenous peoples of Michoacán and then uh, continued um, through, uh, as you can see, Guadalajara, Tepic, Ap Acaponeta. This, uh, so this is where the encounter took place, around here, about Culiacán, but uh, this is the Swa. So, so, so he encountered numerous indigenous groups along the way, um, and he impressed them into service and took them as porters, yeah. No, 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 this is Nuño de Guzmán, but one of his cavalry detachments was, was the one that actually encountered the, uh, the four. They saw, they saw them, yeah. And so Cabeza de Vaca and the others eventually journeyed to Mexico City and they became a sensation in Mexico City. They were shown in uh, churches, uh, told their story. They were sometimes shown naked in churches, pe details that people remember a generation later in Mexico City, this would have been uh, to, yeah, anyways. Yeah. More questions? Yeah. No? Okay. Well, Michael has a question. A question and a first comment. They will have some of uh, Michael's sentences books if you have any books for uh, uh, the night of the aspect if you don't have them for you. But the question I've been the books I've gone for years and then watched some of the films on YouTube. And he mentioned that in this journey they descended the first ethnographer in North America. I think he mentioned there was something like 28 different tribes they encountered. Right. Can you remember anything interesting about some of those tribes? Well, I can tell you something. Uh, yeah, I can tell you something interesting about uh, the tribes that they encountered around here in Texas, which is, um, um, for example, in that island where they washed up that may or may not have been Galveston, um, they uh, encountered two groups that uh, Cabeza de Vaca and the other, uh, the joint expedition, uh, called the Hans and Capoques. That's the name they use. These names and others that they provide for other groups that they come in contact do not match any names that we find in the 18th or 19th centuries because you know, we, we do have 
uh, the name, so they are called Karankawas, and they are further subdivided into groups, and we know what those names are, but they don't seem to match exactly. So the names for the groups that they use are very different in that early time than from the ones that survived later, which again suggests that there was a lot of turmoil between the 1520s and the, you know, middle, mid to late 1800s, when we have a clear picture of who is where and where everybody's living, which means that many of these groups either did not survive or, you know, coalesced into other groups and adopted different names. And so the, the sort of the human geography of the region changed quite dramatically in the, in the intervening time. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Let me give you the little gift. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you so much for coming, and we hope to see you next time.